Uh, we all know that string theory gives us new ways to think about gravity. Well, that's what I want to talk about here. I want to talk about the way that we use ideas that flowed originally from string theory to help us do calculations of direct interest to our friends at LIGO, to the LIGO theorists. So what's the problem? So we want to compute gravitational waves from uh, a compact binary system. Uh, and this can be thought of in terms of three phases. There's the in-spiral, the merger, the ring down. The part we're going to be talking about is the in-spiral because that we can use perturbation theory for. Uh, and the general perturbation theory that's used is post-Newtonian theory. Okay, and the reason why you have to go to extremely high orders is because when you're looking over many cycles, then the phases, the phase errors will accumulate, and by the time you're at the end, you'll be, you'll be completely wrong. So you need very high precision uh, uh, in general. So what's the problem? Well, the basic problem can be found very easily if you've ever done perturbation theory in gravity, which is you take the Einstein action and then you expand it maybe around flat space or some other metric, and then there's the fluctuations, there's the graviton field, and very quickly what you find is that this thing is just a gigantic mess, uh, that, that there's an infinite uh, tower of interactions, and each one of these is extremely complicated. And if you compare that to gauge theory, then you think that, oh, gravity uh, is a little like gauge theory, except it's much, much more complicated. And in, in fact, uh, we can look at some simple examples. You just look at the interactions of three gluons, and you compare that to the interactions of three gravitons, and pretty soon you realize that uh, this is a very complicated theory from this point of view. Uh, th th this thing is written in a very compact way. There's P6, which means six permutations. There's a sim here. You have to symmetrize over the fact that the gravitons are symmetric tensors. and, and uh, if you were a graduate student and your advisor gave you uh, something with a three graviton vertex, you'd say, oh yeah, I should go work on a different problem. Uh, but, but in fact, uh, that's the wrong way to look at it. The right way to look at it comes from string theory. This is 1985, Kawhi Luong and Tai. If you look at the low energy limit of string theory, then you get very nice relationships between gravity and gauge theory. These are what are known as color ordered amplitudes in gauge theory. These are honest to goodness graviton scattering amplitudes. And, and in fact, this generalizes to any number of legs. And it, it, what it tells you immediately is that gravity, in some sense, is completely derivable from gauge theory. And what makes this uh, very, very uh, unusual is that if you try to understand this from the Lagrangian point of view, it would be extremely difficult, even today after many years of studying these relationships, I think it would be almost impossible to have arrived at this conclusion that there's a very simple relationship. I mean, of course, today you can brute force this thing and you can prove these relationships starting from Lagrangians, but I doubt that anybody would have ever seen this. And the other thing that you start realizing when you think about uh, large numbers string theories, the theories that there are, that in fact, these formulas are very generally applicable. Uh, and there, there's actually a much better way of doing this, a much more, a much cleaner way, uh, which we call duality between color and kinematics. And uh, I'll just summarize it very briefly. So take a tree amplitude of gauge theory, rewrite it as a sum over diagrams with color factors, kinematic numerators, and Feynman propagators. And the claim is that there's some way that you can rearrange these kinematic numerators such that they satisfy the same algebraic relations as the color factors. Uh, and, and this is something that's proven at tree level and it's conjectured to hold at uh, loop level where there's many examples. Uh, but uh, the consequence of this is extremely powerful. It says if you want to go from gauge theory to gravity, you take the color factor, you replace it with a kinematic numerator, as simple as that, and that gives you this double copy form of the gravity amplitude. And here's for tree level, this n tilde just means that the two gauge theories don't have to be identical, they can be different gauge theories. Okay, and and uh, uh, this is our basic tool for thinking about gravity. 
Uh, now, to think about loops, we use uh, something called generalized unitarity. Uh, and what this is, it's a technology, a way of thinking about loop amplitudes in quantum field theory uh, by building up the loops using on-shell tree amplitudes. Uh, and there's very standard uh, things that everybody knows about, two particle cuts, three particle cuts, and so on. But, uh, but in fact, you can generalize this idea to think about cuts all over the place. All of these exposed legs here are on-shell. In fact, these generalized cuts are in fact what we're going to do, uh, we're, what we're going to use for the calculations relevant for LIGO. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to explain exactly how this works here, uh, not in the allotted time, uh, but anyway, the basic idea is you can think of this as a, a, as a conceptually cleaner way and much more efficient way to be computing scattering amplitudes at loop level, and of course it has to reproduce Feynman diagrams because Feynman diagrams give the correct answer. It's just a better way of thinking about it. Now the problem we're going to be thinking about is trying to improve the post-Newtonian approximation for a two-body problem. So, uh, of course, Newton started this all. Um, and uh, for orbital mechanics, what we have to uh, keep in mind is there's the virial theorem, V square is like gm over r, they're, they're approximately the same order, so that motivates this double expansion, which is called the post-Newtonian approximation, where you expand both in velocity and, and in the coupling. Uh, here's the first term, that's Newton, second term, that's Einstein, Ilfeld, and Hoffman, work that out. And this Hamiltonian, uh, this post-Newtonian Hamiltonian, it's known to four PN, four, uh, that means fourth post-Newtonian order, and over the years it's been calculated, more and more complicated calculations. This one's from 2014. The reason why people do these calculations is because they're important, because of, light, because of the gravitational wave detectors, LIGO, and, and many other detectors that are going to be coming. So when we started thinking about this problem, we were asking ourselves the question, what problem should we solve? Uh, there, are, there are many problems that people have been looking at. There's spin, finite size effects, radiation, or trying to do higher orders in perturbation theory. Well, to us, uh, there were some boundary conditions of what we needed to do. Uh, first, we wanted to have an impact. It, it needed to be something that was extremely difficult using standard methods. It needed to be of interest to LIGO theorists. And whatever we would do, it had to be in a form that in principle it could enter the LIGO analysis pipeline. Otherwise, uh, probably pick a different problem. So anyway, this is the winner, high orders in perturbation theory. That's what we're very good at. Uh, the problem we're going to look at is two-body Hamiltonian at third post minkowskian order. I'll have to explain what third post minkowskian order is. Actually, I can tell you right now, it, in particle physics, we call it perturbation theory. Uh, in the general relativity community, they give it a fancy name. Uh, well, this, this problem was explained very well in this uh, beautiful talk from Lassandra Bunano at Amplitudes 2018, where she laid out the differences between the post-Newtonian, post-Minkowski, and then explained exactly what needed to be done. So post-Newtonian is you go down the columns. Uh, so there's Newton, V square, and 1 over R. 1 over R means really G over R. And, and there was uh, uh, Einstein and his collaborators, and so on and so forth. And then uh, here's the, the post Minkowski. As you look across this way, all that means is you are doing perturbation theory in the coupling constant, in Newton's constant, and you're keeping all orders in velocity. And that we normally do that in, in uh, uh, particle physics. So to us, uh, it's of course completely natural to be thinking about post-Newtonian, a uh, post-Minkowski, and uh, there's the missing one that needed to be done. Uh, so that's in fact what, what was the obvious problem to work on. Okay. And, and in fact, there's a, a small industry of people who are thinking about applying double copy and ideas and scattering amplitudes to gravitational radiation. Uh, first, you have to understand the connection between the scattering amplitudes and things like the two-body Hamiltonian or other physical observables. Uh, there's the world-line approach for radiation that, that uh, 
I was pioneered by Goldberger and Ridgway. There is some technical issues having to do with removing the dilatin when you do the double copy, like in string theory, it tends to be a dilatin, but we don't want that. Uh, but of course, the key question for us is, can we calculate something of direct interest to LIGO Virgo, uh, which is clearly beyond the previous state of the art? Uh, now, uh, maybe just a, uh, a little comment is that uh, we have experience of doing very high loop orders. We did uh, supergravity calculations, a uh, recent one uh, for the past year, uh, at five loops in n equals eight supergravity. Uh, it turns out that this uh, 3 p.m. problem, the, the one that, uh, that uh, needed to be done, that's a two loop problem. So that looked pretty good. Okay. So what, what's our approach? Well, we follow the path of Chung, Rothstein, and Solano. Their 2018 paper, they explained very well how to do this, uh, laid out the, the, the road that we should follow, which is to combine ideas from the amplitudes community. So this we understand very well, the Kawhi, Loam, and Tai, the, uh, this, uh, this BCJ double copy, and, and other ideas of unitarity. So this we had under control, we knew what we were doing, and then we combined this with ideas from effective field theory. And that gives us post Minkowski. Now, th this might look very inefficient because what we're thinking about uh, quantum, uh, quantum scattering amplitude. You're supposed to take h bar goes to zero, so that looks like a bad idea. On the other hand, we have almost ma magical simplification for uh, gravity amplitudes. So, uh, this question okay, what's going to win the efficiency or inefficiency? And I'll show you efficiency wins. Now, when you start thinking about this problem, you start uh, realizing it's actually uh, quite a bit more subtle than you might have thought. Uh, at, at the lowest orders, it's very straightforward. If you want the potential, you just take a Fourier transform and uh, the scattering amplitude and you're done. Uh, one loop, it's pretty straightforward because you can calculate very well at one loop and then you just inspect the pieces and you say, okay, that's the classical part and you're done. Uh, but very quickly, what you learn is uh, some, something I found ver very astonishing is that uh, at least what they taught me in graduate school was wrong. Not about the h-bar counting. It doesn't work the way I was taught. Uh, you know, hopefully these days they teach it correctly. Uh, the key point is loops can have classical pieces. And in fact, these loops are exactly what we need to calculate to extract the classical part. Uh, and there's issues with double counting and iteration pieces that you have to remove. Uh, it turns out the Feynman diagrams, if you take h bar goes to zero, they're very badly singular. They go to one over h bar to the L, where L is the loop order. When you first see that, you say, my God, what's going on? But then you calm down and you remember e to the i class, s classical, the action uh, over h bar. You series expand, you get one over h bars. That's all it is. But you have to take all that into account. There's cross terms to worry about between one over h bar and h bar. And then, most importantly, what part of these integrals actually contributes to the classical part? Okay. And to clean up all this confusion, we use effective field theory. The effective field theory is very simple. Uh, it's non relativistic uh, scalars interacting. We're going to talk about spinless black holes. Of course, Spin should be included later, but the first problem, it's spinless. So these are scalars. And then the potential is just put in as a four-point interaction. And that's the theory. Uh, and the idea is to match this to the full theory. So the way the calculation is done is you do two calculations in parallel. One is much more complicated. One is simpler. One is in full general relativity. The other one is the effective field theory. In the full general relativity, we take out all the heavy-duty tools we have. We take out amplitudes, methods, double copy. We take out general, generalized unitarity. We, of course, keep an eye on h bar goes to zero to, to try to simplify the calculation as quickly as possible. And then loop integration methods. And that gives us a general relativity loop amplitude. On the other side, we do the calculation starting from an ansatz for the potential. You write down a general potential, and then you feed it through Feynman diagrams. On this side, you're allowed to use Feynman diagrams because this is a very simple theory. Uh, it's, it's hardly anything to gain by using more sophisticated methods. Uh, you do loop integrals, then you compare, and by comparing, you then determine what the potential is. That's how this is done. It looks roundabout, but it's actually very efficient. 
Okay, so how about the full theory? What do we do? Well, the key thing is what you have to do is you have to remove as quickly as possible things that are obviously quantum. So the first thing is you say, well, we want long-range force. And that uh, leads to something that, uh, oh, you know, when we realize exactly how this works, we got very excited because it's right up our alley. The gravitons have to be cut. These legs are on shell. These are on shell gravitons here. So it immediately gives, wor wor meshes very well with the unitarity method. Okay. And then another rule is that to get the classical piece, in fact, there has to be an on shell matter line, one on shell matter line per loop. That's the rule. Uh, and then based on that, it turns out this is the only unitarity cut that has to be done at one loop. So that would be called 2 p.m., uh, even though it's one loop, but anyway, it's called 2 p.m., second post Minkowski. Uh, and for 3 p.m., that's the one we're interested, third post Minkowski, is th these are the unitarity cuts we have to work out. And that's what our tools are designed for. For example, let me just show you how this works at, at uh, one loop. Is uh, uh, you just feed, take the unitarity cut, feed it through the double copy, and that gives you a cut for gravity in terms of gauge field. Now, what about dealing with the dilaton? That's actually completely trivial if you're using helicity states. Basically, it just says that if you have a negative helicity graviton, take a negative helicity gra gluon, negative helicity gluon, and forbid where you have a positive and a negative, and that removes the unwanted states. Uh, in general, it's very easy to do this because when, once you impose the unitarity cut, you have access to the states that are crossing the cut, and you can control exactly what the spectrum is. Okay, so what's the calculation? Actually, this is great fun. This is the input into what's called 2PM. Uh, it's these tree amplitudes is all you need. These are gauge theory color-ordered amplitudes. They're quite simple. You just feed, just feed it through some standard uh, spitter ma machinery, and out pops an answer very quickly in terms of like an, what we call even part and an odd part. Well, it's odd squares, so actually all of it is parity even. And there's this simple answer for the cut. And that's all, uh, all the information that you need. Uh, this is now for Yang Mills. This is the Yang Mills cut. Then you do the double copy, and there's a gravity cut. You'll recognize exactly the even and the odd pieces, except they're squared. So you can see exactly the same building blocks as gauge theory. The reason why gravity is so simple is precisely because the gauge theory is simple. And then you can read the literature and you can go extract whatever you want, potentials and so on. Okay, the real problem is to do this at the next order. And uh, this is an example of uh, one of the cuts. Uh, you, you'll, you'll recognize it has a structure very similar to one loop. There's even pieces, there's odd pieces. Uh, and, and in fact, the calculation is almost the same. The reason why the calculation is almost the same is because it's made out of exactly the same building blocks. It's three point and four point uh, uh, gluon, gluonic or uh, gauge theory scattering amplitudes go into this calculation. Uh, there's some other cuts that have to be computed. There's a five point. Anyway, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, and, and then uh, for technical reasons, we organize this in terms of a set of diagrams, eight diagrams, uh, which we then integrate. How does the integration go? Well, here's the basic idea. Uh, we we, we uh, follow the path of Chung, Rothstein, and Solon. Uh, so the idea is, uh, first, we use a, a non-relativistic approximation. P is the external black holes. Uh, we're going to resum in all orders in P at the end, but at least to do the calculation, it's convenient to make use of this. Uh, and then the classical part is where the exchange graviton momenta is much smaller than the black hole momenta. Uh, and then the potential region is where the energy is much smaller than the momentum transfer. The, this is the energy transfer. Uh, so there's what the integrand looks like. You see matter poles, you see graviton poles, you look at it, you say, wait a second, we don't want any antiparticle poles. So we declare that we're not going to pick up any residues from the antiparticles. And then there's graviton poles. Graviton poles would correspond to a, 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 a region uh, outside of the potential region. Uh, and and uh, uh, so we don't, we don't uh, keep those poles. And then to do the integral, essentially you're picking up just residues 
from the, from the matter poles, not, uh, not from the antimatter. Okay? And we do the integrals, uh, convert it to three-dimensional spatial integrals, which are actually very simple. Uh, you can look it up in a textbook. Uh, the textbook to look it up is Smirnoff's textbook on, on integration. All answers are in there, or, or all methods of, of uh, doing it are in there. Uh, and here's the answer. This is the amplitude. Uh, and it contains all the pieces that are needed for the um, uh, extracting the potential for getting the Hamiltonian. It's not a, a generic amplitude. It's not an amplitude you can use for anything. It's just for our purpose of constructing this two-body Hamiltonian. There's the there's there's the 3 p.m. Hamiltonian. Uh, it might look a little messy, but believe me, this thing is very simple. It's remarkably simple. I'll show you exactly what I mean by that in a minute. Uh, Newton is hiding in this coefficient C1, uh, and, and Einstein's uh, term is some combination of these two. If, if you expand this in velocity or in, or in the momentum, uh, you get uh, the post-Newtonian pieces. So this is resummed all orders in velocity. Okay, uh, just a few comments, uh, some subtleties and features. There are IR singularities. We have to use dimensional regularization. Uh, it, ter it turns out that if you calculate the integrands using four-dimensional methods and compare that to using d-dimensional methods, they differ. However, there's no difference in the final potential, which is good. Uh, it's much better to use helicity methods. Uh, this, I think, is likely true to all orders, but we don't have a general proof of that. Uh, actually, there's a curious feature. Uh, if you inspect our answer, there's an arc cinch in there, and that arc cinch is a log, and as the masses go to zero, you pick up a log m, and those of you uh, may remember that, in fact, quantum amplitudes should not have mass singularities. So you say something is funny here, but in fact, the log m is definitely there, and this has to do with an interchange of limits. Uh, one thing it says is if you're trying to import massless results uh, into, into understanding the potential, you can't do this blindly. Okay, and, and another interesting thing about this is once you have a log m, your first thought is maybe I can resum it. So the log m is not our enemy, it's our friend. We think that we're going to be able to use this to help uh, all orders resummations in, uh, in the gravitational coupling. Uh, and, and there's another technical point. The integrals are done by expanding in velocity and resumming, uh, but we've checked it through covariant techniques, Bell and Barnes, integration by parts. Differential equations, sector decomposition. Yes, we threw the kitchen sink of techniques uh, at, uh, guaranteeing that we did it correctly. Okay, how do we know that the answer is right? The primary check is comparing against uh, uh, the 4pn calculation. So this is expanded now in velocity, but there's an overlap. Uh, and that's from Damore, Deranowski, and Schaefer. And to do the comparison, you have to find a canonical transformation because, of course, the forms are completely different. They use different coordinates, different gauges, uh, and, uh, and from the bottom line is we found the canonical transformation. Our Hamiltonian is, is equivalent to their 4pn Hamiltonian in the overlap, and we did various other checks. Oh, here's a part of the check, uh, just a little amusement. So there's the 4pn Hamiltonian from, uh, from the Morin friends, actually keeps on, whoops, keeps on going. Sorry, it keeps on going. Uh, you say, okay, why is it so messy? Well, there's two reasons for that. One reason is if you take a compact expression and you series expand it, it becomes a mess. And the other reason is unless you have a very careful gauge choice, you will get a mess. Uh, gauge choices can cause a lot of, uh, a lot of grief on, on uh, generating complicated expressions. Uh, with the on-shell methods, we actually never chose a gauge. Uh, there's an, like an implicit gauge, but not, uh, not anything we chose. Okay, so what about our friends at uh, LIGO, the LIGO theory? So there's Alessandro Bunano. I think it's very cool. Eight days after our paper, they, ha they had a paper analyzing the consequences of, of the new information from our 3 p.m. Hamiltonian uh, on what it, what it might mean for the templates. And one of the tests they do is uh, to see how the binding energy compares to the truth. The truth is determined by numerical relativity. The closer you are to the truth, the better. I'm almost done. 
and, uh, and anyway, there's some complicated story how you have to feed this through effective one body uh, models. Uh, and, and you see the winning curve is based on feeding it through the PM, uh, uh, feeding the 3 PM through this machinery. Uh, okay, what exactly this means and how you interpret this for the templates, I don't know, but, but there was a sentence in their paper. This rather encouraging result motivates a more comprehensive study, so that's very good. Uh, what's the outlook? Well, methods are very far from exhausted. Uh, the methods were designed to scale very well to high orders. We've started working at 4 p.m. The methods certainly look up to the task, and of course there's many other topics to investigate. Uh, we want to look at higher orders, and one of the things we want to keep an eye on is resummation in Newton's constant. Uh, there's uh, problems of uh, directly feeding gravitational ra radiation into this formalism. Uh, there's uh, including spin, finite size effects, uh, and there's, I'm sure, many, many more years of work to be done. But in any case, the future looks bright. So the summary is that string theory ideas, they give us new ways to think about problems of current interest in gravity. Uh, the double copy idea is a powerful way to think about perturbative gravity. It's a unified framework for gravity and gauge theory. If you can do a gauge theory calculation, you can always do the corresponding gravity calculation uh, in perturbation theory. Uh, and it, by combining this with effective field theory methods, uh, this gives us powerful new, a powerful new tool for gravitational wave physics. And the demonstration of that, we obtained a 3 p.m. third post Minkowski conservative two body potential. And this is a state of the art calcu calculation. Uh, and I think the best part is the methods are nowhere close to exhausted. Uh, higher order in G, resummations in G, spin finite size effects, radiation, obvious next steps to investigate. And, and final summary, uh, I think we can expect uh, many more advances in the coming years, not only for gravitational wave physics but more generally for understanding gravity and its relation to the other forces through the double copy. Thank you. Are there questions for Tzvi? Hi. Hear me? Yeah. Uh, so, Many years ago, there was a sort of program started by Amati, Cefaloni, and that Veneziano yes. on high energy scattering. Yes. And then you go into Iconal, et cetera, which is sort of a classical thing. So can you say anything about uh, that regime from your calculations uh, or similar? Yeah, yes. Uh, well, I can say we do not agree with them. However, the reason why we do not agree with them is contained in this cryptic comment. Uh, massless results cannot be blindly imported. Those who import them will have trouble. Sorry, I have a question and then a sub-question if I can. Which is, I didn't understand the connection between the effective field theory approach and what you did. Uh, is it that the effective field theory has a few unknown parameters and then you can compute them using right. them as usual? So the, let's go back to this slide. So the effective field theory, it, and maybe it's this slide, is written in terms of the potential that we're interested in. So this is what we want. But to extract this potential, the way we do it is we compute scattering amplitudes in this theory and compare it to scattering amplitudes of the true theory and uh, by making that comparison we get the potential. So it's really a full potential that you have to extract. Yeah, the full, uh, yeah, I mean, think of Newton and continue uh, on, on in the post-Newtonian and then post-Minkowski. So it's the honest to goodness potential. And then the follow-up which I can ask you later is, Incorporating spin in the effective field theory may not be too hard, I mean, in terms of the spinning particle, but perhaps you need the full potential at the end. Um, yeah, we, well, we don't think it's too hard, um, but it, it, it's, it's under study. Yeah, we're, we're definitely thinking about that. I wanted to 
does the, uh, once you remove the quantum part of your loops, or loop integrals, so you don't see any UV divergence anymore, only IR? Yeah, th there's no UV. Uh, it actually uh, works in a very simple way. It's because uh, H-bar counting, I'll see if I can find uh, something. Uh, the H-bar counting uh, is, is proportional, or H-bar is proportional to the momentum transfer. So if I have more powers of loop momentum, it's quant automatically quantum suppressed. And more powers of, uh, of loop momentum um, are, of course, where the ultraviolet divergences come from. So in fact, we do not encounter them. You know, probably at some order you encounter it, but you know, I'm, I'm not worried about that. So we'll, we'll deal with it. Are there other questions for three? Can you reproduce the low energy uh, effects like the, like the Weinberg soft graviton theorem using this? Uh, this uh, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, uh, well, I would, say, I would say a much more interesting version of that question is not can we reproduce it. That, that's easy. The, it's can we make use of it in some very nice and efficient way. That, that I don't know the answer to. But I mean, uh, if you can do that, then you can also uh, study the synthetic structure, gravity using this approach. I mean, the BMS. Uh, it's kind of orthogonal. It's kind. It's kind of yeah. It's kind of orthogonal. I mean, the the main interest uh, we would have with soft theorems is the other way that we would want to use them to make the uh, calculations even more efficient. Uh, oh, by the way, let me declare that whatever we've done. No matter how efficient it is, we are pretty sure this is going to look very primitive in a few years um, because of ma many reasons, but like uh, making, exploiting, for example, soft properties. Since there are no more questions, I suggest that we thank Zvi again. The final speaker of this session is Henning Samtleven from Ecorno